So I did want to talk a little bit about something related to Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe at one time was a very prosperous nation. It was very prosperous and it was a growing economy agriculturally. And that's how all economies begin. If you've ever played any, you know, like Age of Empires video game, you typically start, you know, at the most fundamental of economies, which is agriculture. And so one of the ways to keep many of these nations impoverished is to one, attack their farmland or attack their farmers. And what happens is usually you'll see a nationalization of certain sectors. Depending upon the economy, how advanced that economy is, for example, in Zimbabwe, as they were beginning to advance, one of the things that they did was Zimbabwe's ability to produce, to produce its own food. And so the economy basically starts to grow. And there's an article here that talks about, uh, here we go, right? So we'll, sw we'll flip back, right? So one of the most important things for a nation, as you can see right here, agriculture and food. Agriculture can help reduce poverty, raise incomes, and improve food security for 80% of the world who live in rural areas and mainly work on farming, right? And this is according to the world. And so those are the beginning stages of an economy, right? And so as people get lifted up out of poverty, they now can start to advance into more industrialized economies. And so what you do to halt those economies is you introduce state-driven, state where people no longer have the ability to own private property, and it's basically communism. And this is what happened in Zimbabwe. And so when you see the state seizing important key portions of an economy, those are signs of communism. So moving forward, what was the outcome, right? Back in 2004, right, Zimbabwe moves to nationalize all farmland. As you can see, this article is from 2004. And of course, it's under the guise, right? It says here, ultimately, all land shall be resettled as state property. That's communism. Where you don't have the ability to own the land, that is what communism is, the removal, the removal of private property rights. And so Zimbabwe seized farmland from white farmers. And of course, under the guise, and gave basically the land like I talked about in some of my other videos where you saw the exact same thing with the Native Americans. And so the Native Americans did the same thing with the land that they've been given you know, by the United States on their reservations. And Zimbabwe did the same thing. And so Zimbabwe, at one time, there was an article here, right? Once the breadbasket, this is from 2019, right? From 2019. Once the breadbasket of Africa, Zimbabwe now on the brink of a man-made starvation. And this is according to UN rights experts. And the next article here talks about what was the outcome, right? This is from 2005, right? So not even a year later, it says Zimbabwe, and this is according to Herrera, says the country is too broke to pay for farm improvement. Originally, what you saw was Zimbabwe says, well, we're going to seize the land, but we're going to compensate you. And this is what's happening in the Netherlands, where the, 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 the Dutch government is trying to seize the farmland that is basically generationally owned by families and has been providing food. Um, the Netherlands and the Dutch people, I believe are the fifth or the sixth largest nation that produces food. I think America is like one of the, either the first largest nation that provides food for other countries. And the Dutch, even though it's a small area, they're a very, they're very good at producing food. That they're, even though they're a small nation, they produce a lot of food for the world. And so what you want to do is basically to introduce communism under the guise of we're going green, right? You've got all this fertilizer use, etc. And so we want to reduce, you know, the nitrites and the carbon in the world. So what you need to do is you need to reduce the amount of fertilizer that you use. And so the farmers who've been doing this for such a long time, they understand what the outcome is going to be, that they're not going to be able to make money to pay off whatever debt that they owe. And this is the whole point is you then these people who are in debt, you under the guise of going green, saving the earth, whatever it is that you want to call it, they ruin the business of the farmers so that they can swoop in and basically seize the farmland for pennies on the dollar. And the Dutch farmers understand this. They've been protesting for quite some time now. Now, going back to in Zimbabwe, right? So Zimbabwe did the same thing. 
And it says there, it says they had 4,000 white farms uh, that they nationalized last week that does not have any money. And of course, this is what it says. The government doesn't have any money basically to pay you. So instead of paying them for the farmland, they're like, what we'll do is we'll pay you to make improvements. And of course, that never happened. Moving forward from 2007, what was the outcome, right? From 2007, Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans hunt for food in price control talked about before. When you have communism, they don't put the most intelligent or the most skilled into those positions, right? Who do they put? They put their friends. What happens is they're not worried about the outcome. They're not worried about production. Just like when you look at, for example, um, look like you look at Ford or any of the American-owned uh, auto industries, what you see is you see moral hazard, where these companies are what they call too big to fail, right? And so the government doesn't allow these people to fail, and the, and the company will do things that are not in the best interest of the company in terms of making money, right? Because why would I, I don't have to worry about, like for example, with the climate change narrative, and Ford decided to move away from combustion automobiles and went full on ahead with the whole EV going electric, right? And as a result, because there's no infrastructure, now basically Ford, of course, is having to lay off something like 8,000 workers, which is quite a bit. We're not even into any sort of a recession and Ford is already seeing all these mass layoffs because of the inflation that is basically being created. And so to reduce costs for the company, you just start laying people off. Because they know in the future, if things go bad, the government will just give them a bailout, which is what the government has done often. And so the burden of performance is not there for the company. What you see and what you see with many of these other American companies, which is a bit more of fascism is where the government where the businesses will virtue signal to the government that's why you see kind of like disney and some of these other corporations that they start introducing the whole trans thing and going gay and they start putting all this uh trans and lgbt content and they start putting it into their their movies into their shows and regardless of what happens it's, they're just virtue signaling to the government, we're on your side, right? So it doesn't have to make sense even economically because what they really want is they want the power of the state on their side and so they virtue signal to the state. And this is what happened, unfortunately, the outcome of what happened in Zimbabwe for the people of Zimbabwe is it impoverished them and of course they ran out of food because now they have to import food or be given free food, right? And this is what America does. America or the left, Europe and the Americas, they give food to now these African countries. And since these African countries can't benefit from food production, which is the beginning stages of the economy, that's why you see um, a lot of these young kids and stuff working in the mines, or what they refer to like blood diamonds, right? Because now the basics of an economy begins with the agri agricultural stage. And so this is why you see the, the left or the cathedral or the whole Klaus Schwab gang attacking farmland because it's a way to push back and set back economies to impoverish the people and of course then now you can control the people. And so moving forward, this is what we see Dutch government, right? Dutch government moves to buy out farmers. This is farm as farmers in the Netherlands will be of course asked to sell or relocate or change uh, in, uh, or change enterprises and that does government bid to meet its climate goals, right? So the Netherlands is now virtue signaling, right? In the same way, right? In the same way that businesses, like you see, um, like Disney or Amazon or like whatever other service, whatever other industry, right? They virtue signal to the government. We support, you know, LGBT. We support, you know, Black Lives Matter, etc. They're just virtue signaling to the government. And this is what you see the Dutch. The Dutch government is virtue signaling to the left, to the Klaus Schwab people that, hey, we're on your side, even if it results in the destruction of the country, but this is what communism is. And so the leaders of the country gain power and authority by, be, by being given loans or food, right, in the way of aid. Now, then they control the resources, right? This is what, this is what happens in communism. The same thing that happened in Venezuela, same thing that happened in Cuba, where now the government basically controls all the resources because economically the, the country starts to do bad. So how do you keep soldiers and police, military on your side? You have to control all the resources and basically the people starve and are impoverished. And this is what you see 
moving forward in the Netherlands. And Trudeau, Trudeau is, of course, at the beginning stages, Trudeau is doing the exact same thing, right? Trudeau pushes ahead on fertilizer reduction as province and farmers cry foul. See, oh, what the outcome is going to be. We're not going to have enough food. People are going to starve. But it's a virtue signal from the leadership within the country to those outside the country See, that are not loyal to the people. These people who are in positions of power are not working in behalf of the people. They're working on behalf of the class that, uh, that is above them. And so they virtue signal to them that, hey, we're on your side. We're going to go this. We're going to go green. We're going to remove fertilizers. We're going to decrease farmland. We're going to decrease beef production, etc. And we're going to start pushing all this propaganda to the people. And that's why you see people who are pro big government are also pro this narrative because it doesn't matter what information that you show these people you can show these people that they're completely wrong and what the result is going to be it doesn't matter because these people want the power of the state on their side they want the state to benefit them and so they want basically the welfare they want the welfare and they want whoever their political enemies are to be attacked they want the authority of the government on their side to attack their political enemies, whether you're left or right, it doesn't matter, right? So whoever it is opposite on the political side, like in America, you have Republicans and Democrats, or you know those who are more socialist, those those who are maybe more conservative. This is what they want. They want the ability of the power of the state to enforce, and basically, they want to be the ones who wear the jackboots, right? They want the ability to throw their political enemies into the gulag. This is what you're seeing in many different countries, and this is why you see individuals, this is new, right? This is from July 22nd, right? And talks about what's going on in Canada. This is what you're gonna see, this is what you're gonna see moving forward, right? This is what you're gonna see moving forward in many of these countries who follow this narrative that the people are gonna go hungry. And it's, an, as, as the article I'm talking about Zimbabwe, it is a man-made crisis. The only solution is force, unfortunately. You're not going to be able to protest your way out of this. There's numerous protests that are going on in the world. But when push comes to shove, the state will utilize either military or police to utilize force. When that happens, you have to be willing, you have to be reserved in here to say that once that line is crossed, then we will push back with force. In countries that where the people don't have weapons and they don't have the ability to defend themselves, this is where those people unfortunately have no choice because the agenda, the global agenda, is doesn't matter if we have to kill our own citizens. And that's why it's so important for Americans to maintain their weapons. Even though you, con you constantly see the attack on the right to bear arms being pushed, who is it being pushed by? It's being pushed by the left, right? Because the left want, and people who favor the government want your ability to defend yourself in these scenarios removed so that you're basically at the mercy of the state. Everybody suffers in these situations, right? It doesn't matter if you're left or right, if you're pro-government or not. Everybody suffers under, under the power of communism. And when that happens, that's why I said, if you see, in my, last, my talking about one of my last videos, that if you start to see the American government going this way, the most important thing that you can have is land, so that you can produce your own food, and a way to produce your own energy, and the most important thing is community. Because you can't be a lone wolf out there trying to survive. You need people. You need people. Just like you see the left, right? All these people are all grouped together. Right? Remember the whole Build Back Better? No matter what country you looked at on the news, they all had that same slogan, same propaganda, because they're all like this. And since they're all like this, you have to be like this with your neighbors. It's one of the reasons why you see where people in cities, there isn't that need to stick together. Even though you live, you know, literally feet away from your neighbors, a lot of times you don't even know because you're not dependent upon your neighbor because all your other needs are basically met by the state or by businesses in your local area. I don't need to be married because I can call the police, I can call a plumber, I can call a fireman, etc. right? There's always somebody that you can call for assistance. But when you live on, off the land, you have to know your neighbors because help is a long way off. They're maybe hours away where they're not able to assist you if you become critically injured. And that's why you need your neighbors and that's why in the country everybody knows everybody because everybody has to depend on everybody. And that's the benefit.
even though everybody kind of is, is in everybody else's other business, but that's a trade-off, and life is a series of trade-offs. And that's why it's so important to understand what is going on globally, the global agenda, and basically what are the steps that these individuals are going to take to get to their agenda, to get to their goal. Once you understand the goal, then you understand how they get there. The only th- and the best thing that you can do, of course, is to resist at every way, shape, or form. And the moment that violence by the state is utilized against you, you have to be resolved inside to say that me and my community will stand together, even if we have to push back against those who are pro-state. For a lot of people on the right, for conservatives who are pro-police and pro-military, you have to get rid of that mindset because these people work for the state. It's just like when you watch many of the old movies and you had the king's men, right? You had the soldiers that worked for the king. That's basically what police and military are. They're just people who are just agents for the state. And when push comes to shove, yes, there will be those who will conscientiously object, which is what you saw during the riots during 2020 and 2021. You saw many police officers that just said, I'm not with the agenda, and they left. But the ones who stayed were ones who were loyal to the state. And it didn't matter if they had to beat you up. I mean, there's so much content video out there showing police officers beating citizens, right? Just because they were anti-vax, right? They, or they weren't pro the narrative that was going on. And so you saw police officers out there like with the truckers, right? The truckers ended up getting beaten by and some people got, you know, knocked over by horses and trampled by horses. And you saw this in country after country after country. Police would come out, they'd hose people down, they'd be beating people with batons or they brought out the dogs. When that happens, you have to be resolved in here, long before that event comes. You have to be resolved in here how far you will go to fight for your freedom. You have to be willing to put your life on the line. I think it was, what was it, Ronald Reagan that said that freedom is not handed down to your children through your blood, right? Like traits. You have to be willing to fight for it, even if it, even if it requires you to spill your own blood in the process. Anyway, I want to leave you here. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time. And I might add, the Second Amendment from the day it was passed limited the type of people who could own a gun and what type of weapon you could own. You couldn't buy a cannon. Those who say the blood of the, the blood of patriots, you know, and all the stuff about how we're going to have to move against the government. Well, the Tree of Liberty is not water with the blood of patriots. What's happened is that there have never been, if you wanted to think you need to, have weapons to take on the government. You need F-15s and maybe some nuclear weapons.